Well, thank you guys for joining us today. I know this is kind of coming towards the end of the day, so thank you for sticking around. We're really excited um, about the discussion that we have for you today. Thank you, Isabel, and the Creative Tech team, um, or Creative Tech Week, rather, um, for having us. Um, I have some amazing panelists today who are excited about the topic of the intersection of art, creative technology, and social impact. Um, so I'll go ahead and start introducing everyone, and then we can jump into the conversation. Um, and so first, to my left, I have Lisa Godwin, who is currently a creative technologist with the New York Times. Um, she's used skills honed from her past 10 years of experience producing immersive experiential products for strategic brand growth for um, a very large VR push at New York Times. Um, Lisa is often seen amongst discussions involving technology and business. Um, I'm excited to have her here today specifically because she can help us think through how um, some of these technology platforms can be monetized and used and pushed out for social good. Um, next we have Katinka Tabakaru. Um, she is a gallerist here um, in New York. Uh, her work spans projects with, um, or, I'm sorry, a gallerist here in New York with an interesting background actually in law um, and human rights. Her work spans projects with the UN's International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda to founding Women's Voices Now, um, a provocative organization aimed at giving a voice to women living in Muslim majority countries through the medium of, um, of film. Katinka's current focus is art, dealership, and curation via her gallery, which expands past its walls to create a valuable dialogue and collaboration with artists um, embedded in different cultures. Thank you, Katinka. Next, we have Kevin Stanton, um, who is an art school alum from the Art Institute of Chicago and also has a graduate degree from NYU's art politics program. Um, he is now a senior strategist with Spring Studios. Kevin works at the convergence of culture, technology, and critical theory. Someone once said of Kevin, he's always there, always curious, and always asking why while having a set hypothesis in his back pocket. <laughs> so I'm hoping today, Kevin, you can help us answer or ask the right questions as we're talking about this, this topic. And then last but not least, um, Sundar Raman, who I actually work with on a day-to-day. -day. He is the director of creative engineering <laughs> with local projects. Um, he has a background spanning permaculture and open source advocacy. So he brings a very unique perspective to his day-to-day -day work. Um, and he's led the creative technology thinking for institutions such as the 9-11 Memorial Museum, if you guys have been there, um, and the Cleveland Museum of Art. So thank you guys for joining us. Um, I wanted to start off this panel with actually a quote um, that I want to throw up here. Um, this is from JFK. Uh, we must never forget art is not a form of propaganda but it is a form of truth. Um, and this is kind of referencing the last panel um, that was on stage, um, referencing that, that truth theme. Um, one of the reasons I fell in love with art and also technology um, is because it is a platform or a way to tell the truth. And I think that is very important right now. Um, so I want us to kind of use that as a tone, to set the tone for the discussion today. Uh, and also to kind of frame the discussion as well, when thinking about the political and societal state, there are so many obvious disconnects and points of tension across nations and ethnicities right now. Um, my belief is that artists and creative technologies in particular um, are uniquely positioned to provide platforms that mobilize and bring truth to inaccurate stereotypes and falsehoods about a number of different communities. Um, I don't know if some of you have seen the work of Defy Ventures and um, Oculus. They've partnered for a really interesting VR film that's at the Tribeca Film Festival um, that brings light to um, uh, inmates in a California state prison. Um, and it really, it, it creates a sense of empathy um, because you are actually able to see um, between the inmates as well as the volunteers of Defy Ventures, um, the similarities in some of the, the life experiences they've all had, um, regardless of their circumstance. So 
it's an interesting use of creative technology um, to kind of bring empathy into a space. So with all of that said, I want to turn this over to our panelists. I want to um, start with a general question about why did you all want to join this panel? What was it about this topic of the intersection of art, creative tech, and social impact? What, did, what connected you to it? For me, coming from a strong technical background, um, every industry is trying to utilize creative technology into their domains. How can they monetize it? How can they get their message across? And with art, that is one of the um, industries I'm seeing rapidly growing using creative technology, using a social impact, getting their message across. For example, like protest art that's becoming really big right now, what's currently going on in our society. Um, art is playing a really big role in getting messages across and people are coming up with creative ways to bring that through, bring the message through. So that's actually what attracted me to this topic. Um, besides your lovely self. <laughs> Which is why I said yes. Um, technology is something that uh, has changed the entire art world. So uh, the way that business was done, the way that artwork was propagated, the way that it was sold, all of that was completely different 15, 20 years ago. Um, so not only does it permeate every single moment of my life, but it, it changes the way that um, I communicate. And, and that's me as a dealer and as a curator. And then I watch the artists who I work with and how they communicate and they have to um, consider to some extent the way that um, the message they put across will be interpreted or the way that it can reach a larger audience. And in the end, um, that's my major interest. My major interest is I want the world to see my work and the work of those artists and curators and administrators who I support. And technology is at the center of that. Um, it is the, the microphone, the loudspeaker that gives us so much power. And art has always had intrinsic value, but now it has real power as well because it can reach so many people. And technology did that. Um, the internet started 20 years ago, is that, is that what it is? And it put 3 billion people on the grid who never had access before. And now they do. Um, and that's a, it's an incredible popularization of everything. Um, so I guess for me, the thing that is drew, drew me to this panel was the idea of engagement. Um, all day long, I have a ton of clients who just call us up and like, how do we engage more people? Like, how do we, like, I want them to participate with my brand more. This is from a business perspective. But my, back, my background in the art world, uh, participation was the word that was used kind of before technology kind of came along, right? So you were like artists in, in museums and things where how do I get people to participate with my project, my institution, my gallery, my whatever it might be. And so now it's interesting that, um, you know, technology is the way that people are now trying to drive engagement, be it an AR experience as we just saw or a site or something like this. And so it's, it's almost like the Wild West of trying to figure out how to do that in a way that is authentic or natural or whatever you want to call it, um, but in a way that is also uh, beneficial to the person who wants to do it. And that's, that's maybe the, the reason that I was drawn to this panel, and hopefully we can figure that out. <laughs> uh, mostly I'm here because you asked me to be here. <laughs> no, seriously, though, it's, uh, for me, I think about it very differently, and I think you know this about me slightly. The perspective I have is that we're, we're basically approaching zero. Like, so far, we've been in a situation where we've separated out the world into the artists, the technologists, and the neither of, of these two. And it's actually not true. Like, only in the last, like, maybe, you know, 100, 150 years have we even uh, defined these roles so strictly. Prior to that, cavemen didn't go around going, I'm the artist who had to, like, figure out how to grind the redstone to make the art that goes into the cave of uh, Forgotten Dreams. Uh, and we're coming, we're coming, we're kind of stepping back to that role where the vocabulary is now rich enough that we can forget about literacy in the way that we've been talking about it so far. And art and technology need to be thrown away. Like, uh, like to say something very incendiary, 
we sort of put ourselves into these buckets and we start thinking of ourselves as something important. But we actually have an opportunity right now where technology has, has become so prevalent, so easy to build everything from computer to software. The open source movement has kind of made this accessible to everyone. We have very high literacy rates, even in like the most impoverished place, places in the world. So we can take this as the new language. Like people know how to use a cell phone before they, they know how to read in, in countries where there is zero literacy. In India, for example, like farmers are able to use cell phones to have banking transactions and they don't even know what they're reading. They only know the numbers that are there. And you have, you have a, a model that we have now come up with that I think the opportunity is to create this new language, this vernacular that we can all have as a common platform to move forward from. For me, it's like the, this conversation is about like, what is the opportunity to, to set the baseline for us all to like build a world that we can actually start using these new tools as, as the alphabet to build from. Not like this is something new that we've just created that is, is now giving vehicle for political activism or whatever else. That's interesting. I want to better understand to, you know, like you said, we put each other in these different categories and we often say it's your role to do X, Y, and Z. It's your role to do something else. What do you think the role of a creative technologist is in creating platforms or new languages um, that people can that can bring people together? Is it, you know, whose responsibility is it? Is it only the creative technologist to to code something to develop something? Is it who who needs to be involved in this? And and how do we get people to work together to be involved in creating those types of platforms? I think you have to open it up. So at this point, we can see that kids are, like there are 11-year-old kids writing iOS apps. And it, it kind of disturbs me in a way because these are kids who are writing apps in a closed platform. There's, there's nothing open about the Apple platform at all, as much as people want to like, talk about it from other, other perspectives. Uh, it's great to, to give that vehicle to kids. But also kids who are building like new hardware because the engineering aspect of it has been opened up. To the degree that when I was a kid, I couldn't build some of these microcontrollers because the, the kind of um, the root language did not exist yet. And we've made it so accessible for people, the so magic has gone away, which is really important. Like There shouldn't be this magic of engineering is complicated or art is complicated. And I think we, we ha that's the, the opportunity right now to kind of dismiss the role of the creative technologist as someone who knows something and to go like, I know how to digest something complicated into something that someone who, does, who doesn't work in that field can understand. And it's super important because it's like, otherwise people start going, oh, you're, you're a mathematician, I don't understand, it's like super complicated. But it's the same, like you just have to find the metaphor for people to understand this and, and that carries forward really easily. And that, that's sort of the responsibility I think that we have because the tools are available. We should be able to disseminate this information super easily, which is why, I mean, like platforms like YouTube kind of do this. Like, you know, people who are not, you know, engineers by profession or training can get up there, provide their explanation of something, and you, you get to pick which explanation makes sense for you. I think that's our biggest sort of responsibility at this point. Um, when I uh, when I ran this film festival, one one of our focuses was to get films from as many countries as possible in order to have as many diverse voices as possible and get a real sense of what was happening with the expansion of women's rights all over the world. And and the surprising aspect that came in was that we had to change the way that we view the films because. Um, you would get this very polished, beautiful, professional film from Texas. And then you get this kind of um, sort of rougher, not following the rules of cinematography type of film from somewhere in Afghanistan. Uh, but its power was not defined by the technology that was used. Yet technology gave them both power to create what they were creating. So in this idea of opening up, I, I'm reading recently about, I mean, we send so much kind of broken technology to quote unquote developing countries and these kids are putting them together and creating new ways because they were never formally trained to use it or to build it or to engineer it and so they're just finding thinking outside the box they're finding new ways of filming building creating and I think it's a it's a light for us 
to see that um, all of a sudden this thing that we've been learning this entire time or these uh, perfected polished rule following ways that we've been doing things are not the only way. So not only does that democratize, but I think for us it also it opens up the world to new ideas and it also makes us change our own perceptions of who people in certain countries are, um, who women in this case in certain countries are. Um, all of our prizes ended up going to Iran, Afghanistan, Yemen, Somalia, because they were the films that made people understand something new and made people feel something so so deeply. And some of them were literally created from footage taken on phones. Um, it's interesting. It's not necessarily about the fidelity or you know the the final product or the output is more about the intent um, or the emotion behind what's being produced. The final product was great. It was just different than what we're used to, mm. right? It, it didn't follow this, um, I don't know, we're so used to seeing a film in a certain way and seeing a picture in a certain way and seeing an image in a certain way. And actually, as we're so hungry these days for new, everything, everything that's a little bit old is already passe, this newness, this almost uh, less polished, more broken, more dirty, is what is inspiring new ideas. Correct, because it gives inspiration to perfect those um, ideas. You know, seeing the you know the imperfections of what's happening now, and you know, like people feel like, oh, I can take this idea and turn it into this because it's not sometimes all about. Reinventing. It's not all about creating a new product. Sometimes it's keeping the world going, reinventing what's already done. So, you know, I think it's, it's inspiring for um, creatives to recreate some of those um, items that you may see to try to perfect, perfect it, per se. It's the parallel versus the advancement. Correct. Which I think is super, super interesting now. Of I don't think the goal is what's next, what's new, but mm -hmm. how do we broaden what we accept as fitting within this tight little box we've created in the West. I don't think it's a box anymore. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. I think just coming from, um, we work in an experience design firm, and we're always thinking about how to create the best next new experience, next new thing. Um, and this idea of, you know, what's currently out there, how can we iterate on um, maybe something that's already been put out there and just enhance it in a, in a sense, I think it's interesting. Um, going back to another point that you made about collaboration and bringing people together, um, I, I see a lot of artist collectives often. Um, one that comes to mind um, is this new super, or not new, but it's a super pack um, that Hank Willis Thomas created on Call for Freedom. Um, it is um, a collective aimed at talking about the core values of um, democracy in the U.S. throughout. Um, they created this during the um, last election, um, and it brought up some really interesting kind of topics and discussion points. Um, I have seen a few kind of groups of creative technologists get together to create um, to create something similar, um, but. I'm wondering if you all have any um, uh, points of inspiration or projects that have inspired you in the art or creative technology space that you see people collaboratively working together um, uh, to, to push out a message or to um, raise the right questions right now. Um, one piece of artwork that was done back in like 1980s, I, I believe 1987, it was created by our cradle jar, mm -hmm. um, which it needs to be resurfaced, and I believe now um, there are artists right now trying to like re-collaborate and resurface that project that he particularly did back then because he did a billboard in Times Square, a digital billboard that outlined with the map of the U.S., and it says, this is not America. And I think that fits right now, especially with everything that's going on in our political climate, that some of us feel like this isn't America, like what's happening with our presidency and all the things that's happening in the White House and just things that are just happening around the world, it makes it feel like, where are we again? Like, what's going on? So I definitely feel like that is a piece of art that um, currently is going to be resurfaced and it needs to, like currently right now, just with where we are with things. 
any other projects that you all can think of? Uh, there's a digital platform called uh, New Hive, I believe it's called, uh, part of the New Museum's incubator. But things like that that are um, kind of allowing for other possibilities in tech and digital platforms, I think, are like really interesting. So essentially, it's a it's a almost like a Tumblr, but you compose images on top of each other and you make like these dreamscapes or platforms or boards, as they call them. But I, I'm really interested in how people are like even taking Instagram and trying to use it in a different way that it's not meant for. Yeah. And there's all kinds of just like weird things going on that like are not appreciated, but that to me is where some interesting collaborations coming about. Like five people using Instagram to do something weird because Instagram doesn't appreciate it, but we try it anyway. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that to your point about like young people, I, I, I'm also like where, where, I understand like following the rules to build something, but then why are you also not breaking those rules? You know? yeah. Uh, I, I totally agree with sorry, totally agree with uh, uh, Kevin about the Instagram side because I, I find Instagram oddly as much as I probably shouldn't be promoting Facebook's ecosystem <laughs> uh, that uh, it, it's a platform that kids have figured out how to hack and I, I'd say kids as in like not age group but people who are new to using technology because they don't they don't know what the rule set is about using that specific technology. Uh, Teju Cole, the Nigerian-born or Nigerian descent author, used long-form text in his imagery, in his Instagram posts, which is really inspiring to me. And then I started seeing all these other people who, I think just last night, I found this woman in like a small town in India, this state called Orissa, which has very unique and kind of interesting Indian food, and they're known for Orissa and restaurants in New York, unfortunately. But she puts full-on recipes with her imagery and it actually tells me her story as i'm going through but it, it's not like i i don't want to see the the kind of uh, mechanic mechanics of the photography like she's using photography as one aspect of telling the story of her life but she only does it in this one medium you know she doesn't have like an online personality anywhere else but and this is the sort of like uh kind of hacking of the system that has always been going on yeah. But I think that's where like there's this interesting language that's starting to develop. And Instagram's gonna go away after a while. Like it, it is by no means a permanence of anything. In mean, the same way that Orkut was so popular in the world and nobody in the US used it. But Orkut was how every person I knew, every kid I knew in India was was like communicating on social networks. Completely gone. And then that platform got shut down by Google. Uh, similarly to High Five and you know, like MySpace. As, as much as MySpace was the medium of communication for all these kids, you know, high school and early college, it's, it's gone away. But like, I think the fact that kids knew that they, they could drive the language was what was important. Uh, you know, like they can hack it, they can like start like creating new things. I think that the danger is when we have, like exactly what you're saying, um, I think uh, uh, the fact that these kids in Afghanistan, they don't know what the bounds of the technology is, they, so they go, let me try and figure out how I can like screw something else to this and solve the problem of my getting a message across. They don't have to have an engineering background to figure this out. They just have to have inquisitiveness. They have to not have fear of breaking shit. And I think that's like kind of the core thing. So the, as long as you have a mentor that goes, okay, if you break this thing, if you fuck it up, I will help you like unfuck it up, you know? Mm -hmm. And th that's so important in all of our lives, right? I mean, that's how we kind of get to that next step. The same thing with writing. You know, you have authors like uh, uh, William Saroyan or like, you know, Langston Hughes or people who like deconstructed the, the regular writing platform and said, no, I'm going to do this in a different way. And that kind of helps like this mode go forward. And that's where like the inspiring art is for me. You know, it's like yeah. where I see kids kind of take this to different levels. I mean, I've got friends who are working on these projects that are really cool, um, you know, like, most people here probably know Not Impossible Labs. They've done like amazing stuff. Um, as another friend of mine who's like working on this thing called Hello Hub. Like, these are all using technology, mm -hmm. but how people actually subvert the technology that's put there to do something completely new, that's where I think like the, this like inspiration is coming from. Like, you know, take it to the moon kind of situation. There's, um, there's an artist named Amalia Ullman. I don't know if you guys have seen it. If you haven't, check her out on Instagram because that's really where you get her brilliance and I'm leaving behind the, co the collective's question um, but I think it's really interesting what you're saying because 
Amalia is one of these artists where you'll go into her gallery shows. She shows with James Fuentes, among other amazing galleries. Um, and you go in and you're a bit at, at a loss. It doesn't work physically. It's, it'll be two photos, some curtains, and a pole. And it has all of this deep messaging and theory, but it just doesn't get the power across. If you are looking at her Instagram account and just passively looking at the images, I've shown it to people who know very little about art, and they're able to come up with words like abstract and absurd. And in this character that Molly Alban has created on Instagram, there's a, all of a sudden like a sense of understanding uh, implied and, and non-direct communication. Uh, she, to give you a, a quick, in a nutshell, she has created an entire character who is not herself in theory, or maybe it is. And so she plays between fiction and truth. She, um, she went to North Korea. All of a sudden we had all this access to North Korea because she was posing as a tourist. And yet in her commentary, she's, she's looking in the mirror and doing these like sexy poses in lingerie, but all we're hearing in the background are the, the sort of like voices of propaganda that are happening outside her hotel. And that can survive because everyone's so focused on her sexy poses, they assume that's what the post is about. And yet if you look a little bit deeper, you're like, oh my God, in North Korea, they just see all the people messaging all the time. So there, there's this power to image or to just simply to access again, to, to infiltrating voices and governments and I think maybe that's where creative technology comes in as well is the world is run by old white guys but old white guys don't really get technology so all this <laughs> but all of a sudden we the rest of us do get it and it's almost like a secret language and there's so much power in that and how much we can communicate it's like some of the simplest things um older people struggle with, struggle with you know, something so simple as in like Instagram, uploading a photo, you know, like what a hashtag, like what, what, what am yeah. I doing? Like user stories, like what is these stories? Like what do you mean it goes away in 24 hours? But like I tell people, nothing goes away. It's, it's, it's there. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, I do feel like the older generation do struggle with like all the new emerging technologies that's happening. And, you know, unfortunately, yeah, that is I mean, as will we in theory, mm -hmm. but it's also because it's time to move on. Right? It's time to move on from these ideas. You, you watch television every day and it's like one scandal after another. They're all old white guys. If you just kick out the old white guys, it would just be a better place. Show me a war that hasn't been started, an international war that hasn't been started by an old white guy. Well, I'll, I'll contest that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I hope somebody would. I sound it's, ridiculous. It's old guys of, of every color and every color. Like, it's trust different. me, I come from yes, like, yes. a pretty messed up <laughs> and, you know, we've got a guy who, ironically, people love him right now, who is just as insane as the guy who's here. But, um, no, it is funny because I, I think there, there is a little bit of a danger in thinking of the art and technology world as being subversive. Because we're not. Sorry, like the political uh, glitterati, the, the political elite understand what we are doing significantly better than we understand what they are doing. This is why you can have an old and completely insane white guy running like an operation like he, he is right now with zero consequences. And uh, I mean, that, that is not an overstatement by any stretch of the imagination. We think that our protests are of some value, and they are. But they're of value to ourselves. It's like we're patting ourselves on the back. Now, I say this not as a, as a point of like, you know, a downer, but like a lot of people around the world live with that reality for 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years. You know, you've got situations where we ended up putting people into power that six generations later, they're still dealing with the aftermath of it. Now, we're getting a taste of that. But in that, the power that technology and art has is that it gives us our long term voice. Like, we're, we're blips in the, in the ecosystem right now, right? But we actually can leave these messages, the, the breadcrumbs, for people to actually build from. Children, so like you look at the uh, vast majority of what we would call the third world, you know, so large tracts of Africa, large tracts of Asia, where the average population, uh, the average age of the population is somewhere in the early 20s all the way to the early 30s. 
very, very, very young. Those are the kids that don't have a prior message because their parents and grandparents, I mean, most of, that, most of their mentor system has been killed by war. But like the thing that persists is the, the technology and art. Like what, that's the message that can get passed on or it's religion and politics. So it's like, you know, if they see something that is a piece of art that's there, like a carving, that somebody left that people didn't understand the political implications of it directly, and we come back to it years later and they go, oh, like this is something I can keep. Talking drums kind of situation, like this is a mechanism for people to convey, convey form, and that art is still there. Like I know how I have to carve this thing out. And that, that's so important for people to keep in mind. It's like there's like this, like this very long tail to, to like the political activism or like the, the resurgence of a, of a culture and community that I think we often kind of go, hey, we can like solve a problem here by protesting. But the protest is actually like creating the tools that we disseminate for people to be able to dissect and build on their own. But, and that's the thing that I think a lot of the, the people in power don't want. They want you to digest things in the way that you, they want you to digest them. Right. You are going to buy the Tesla car that you can't take apart. You are going to buy the iPhone that you cannot take apart. And that is the thing that has become super dangerous. Art cannot be created until you can make your own brushes, you know? And it, it is super important that you understand that process. You know, engineering can't be done until you can write the code to like take apart systems and build it back together in a more efficient way than Intel inten in that intended for you to. So I think that's kind of important to, to keep yeah. in mind for this process. I take it as if you're not an Apple fan. I'm not an anything fan. And, uh, sorry, uh, Apple's a very convenient scapegoat. Kind of but yeah, like I mean, every Google's the same way. I mean, I've basically given my life up to Android at this point, which is terrible because, like, there's I cannot take apart my device, which is which is like a, a kind of core issue. It, it's sort of like if I had to make a meal and I could only buy Campbell stuff. That that's basically the world that we live in, and, and I mean true. the art in that is great because Warhol can like make his paintings about this. But the commentary is not enough. It is that there's a, a there's another aspect of the art which is to violate the the thing that people are trying to stop you from doing. So to take the law and take take it past, the, you know, to take it to the ludicrous is kind of where our our responsibility is mm -hmm. to go. Wait, you, you're trying to put me into this category, and the category doesn't make any sense. You're trying to make me so. I mean, like, just to use like the race situation, because I mean, we all kind of understand this very clearly. Fifty years ago, in this country, I could not walk into certain restaurants and drink water, which is crazy as a concept. Twenty years ago, we couldn't grow a certain plant that is that just grows around and smoke it. It's, it's just kind of, and we still can't in like significant parts of the country, right? So these sorts of insanities kind of drive like the way that we think. And so that's what I, I think the responsibility of the subversive aspect of art and technology is. Like push the fact that the law doesn't make sense. Push the fact that these things are, are what the next generation has to learn how to keep doing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I think we don't have that much time left and I Sorry. I, no no no. As we no, as we wrap this up, I wanna wanna end with that that idea of deconstruction. It's deconstructing thought. It's deconstructing the boxes that we put ourselves in or that society put ourselves in. Um, deconstructing the parameters in which art and creative technology is used. Um, I think, Kevin, as a strategist, you deal with you know clients coming to you to strategize on how to utilize tools and how to best communicate things. Um, but I'm wondering if, as a collective or as a group, what are some strategies for empowering people to deconstruct thoughts and deconstruct the propaganda and the things that are being pushed at you? Or what, how, do we, how do we use art and creative technology to deconstruct those things? Uh, it, it's a huge question. Yeah. <laughs> a lot. We yeah. can't, we can't uh, answer all that uh, right now. Exactly what you were setting up, though, of, of like how far can you push the law? And then when you realize that boundary, go beyond, right? In, in businesses, we have. Best, uh, best practices, right? Mm -hmm. That's essentially defining the law for yourself of yeah. like, here's the five things that I have to do because everyone else is doing them, but they're self-inflicted, right? Yeah. So like, as as a, as a strategist, I'm always like, well, why why are those the best practices? Like, 
you could there's 15 other things that are not accounted for in, in this document. Why are why aren't those considered, right? And if those are the best practices, are those really the things that we want to be doing because everyone else is doing them already? You yeah. know, so then it opens up the conversation of let's consider something else and see what the outcome is because it might be more interesting, more valuable uh, to our business, but also people at large. So I think we have a little bit of time for audience questions. Anyone yeah. else has a question about this topic? Are there any questions? I'm going to grab Kenji first. Um, I'm currently really interested in learning about blockchain technology and technology? blockchain oh. and uh, the potential for decentralized economies and culture. I'm very interested in culture and how blockchain will change culture and art. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that in terms of social change. I don't have the best answer, so what else? No, go for it. <laughs> um, I'll start with, I don't know what blockchain technology is. But from what was explained to me, the biggest problem that I have run into in my experience has been land reform in Zimbabwe. Um, and what happened with land reform is in 2008, the people rose up. They decided they're going to take um, the land from what was given to the British farmers who are now Zimbabweans. And so uh, Mugabe said, yes, go ahead. And so the land passed on to the local population. Um, anywhere between 75% and 100% of the land was taken away from the old farmers. That led to its own problems of uh, Zimbabwe turning from being the breadbasket of Africa to being to going into ultimate famine and a bread crisis. Assuming that the systems would be in place where um, the internet would be so powerful that if Zimbabwe were to enter into a system where deeds for land were to be um, locked in so that we knew exactly how they passed on. In theory, um, people wouldn't lose their land. Um, and that, I guess, could apply across nations where governments come in and without accountability take land from one and give to another, which I think happens all over the world constantly. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like we just watched it happen again in a few nations, never mind what was happening after World War II. So I would think um, land ownership would be something that would help be helped. My question to the panel is about, uh, I have a hypothesis that uh, along with technology, we paid the price of losing certain sensibilities and uh, tactability. I mean, Artists no longer draw or the pen. Well, that's a whole other thing. But anyhow, <laughs> loss of, 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 let's just say loss of, or a decrease in sensibilities. So do you see the intersection of art and technology as a, as a way to either help uh, to, you know, people to remember, you know, our sensibilities or to enhance our set sensibility through time in, in the longer term especially? For me, yes. It's. I mean, I, I feel like every mode of technology allows us to retain a longer memory in some ways. And, and I say that knowing full well that most of the technology that we are familiar with today, I mean, in my lifetime, and I'm reasonably old in, in this crowd, technologies that I grew up with have been obsolete, like quite completely. The floppy disks that I have my thesis on cannot be read anymore. At least not like any technology that I have today. Similarly with the DAT tapes, the you know the you know, quarter inch disk, you know, like that. There's a bunch of technologies that have been obsolete. But like there is longevity to certain other things. You know, like formulas that we have, we know how to keep. Uh, things like uh, the example I was saying before, like these recipes of this area that I am really interested in. Those recipes I keep fearing will get lost. That they're super important because of the way that certain spices and, and flavors are combined. Instagram is helping bring that back into focus for a wider audience than it would normally have had because this lady would have only written like these recipes down and shared it with the people that she knew. Now some kid in New York is looking at a woman in Bhubaneswar and going, 
hey, you know, this is cool, you know. Similarly to shows like, you know, Chef's Table, where it's like, you know, you, you're inspiring a new um, kind of audience almost to take that art using the technology of today to disseminate in a wider way. And I, and I, and I'm very hopeful about this. Like, you know, I, I think that there's a much longer, like, value to the proposition. Just to piggyback off of that as well, um, one of the technologies I think that will be around for a while helping push this is augmented reality. Um, I recently read an article where students at like San Jose State University, um, one of the students, a graphic design student, is working on a project there where he's taking black and white photos of individuals or of groups um, from different marginalized um, areas. And once you view the image through an iPad, it turns into an augmented reality video of what's happening in the picture. So it gives the users a sense of what's happening and what's happening on the picture to um, kind of not give those preconceived notions of what you may think is happening in the picture or what you may think, it, you know, what you may think that you're viewing. So um, I definitely believe like augmented, augmented reality is one of those technologies that's gonna be around for a while that's going to um, help you know, with that sense of sensibility and, you know, it's going to really help um, bring value to that. One last thing to add to that. Um, I, I just think of the, the promise of social media or uh, technology that enables social connections. I think it's still, like, very undiscovered and, you know, like, I don't know if you guys remember, but, like, chat roulette was the thing back, like, five years ago. <laughs> like, you would just, like, have a beer and get on and, and be talking to someone in Russia and you're like, who are you? Like, what's happening? Like, like and like, and, be, and, and, and there's, like, other things like this, right? But it's, like, that, that fact that you can meet someone that you would ne never, ever met in, in New York or elsewhere, right? It's, like, that, to me, is, like, where the sensibility of technology starts to come together. And I want to pick up on what we were talking about, just to make sure we don't lose that point. But um, I would uproot the fear that technology is going to take away the pen and the pencil. Um, working in the art world, drawing is just as powerful now as that there is VR and that there is video as it always was, because these are parallel editions. I don't think when video came in, when VR came in, when augmented reality came in, they didn't assert what was there before. They just added themselves into line. So there are different notches on a belt. Um, there's, there are more tools for an artist to use, potentially. Um, but one thing that Ray and I were talking about last night was the further the pendulum goes towards VR, towards the virtual, outside of the physical, the more there's a desire to hold on to the physical, to the raw, to, the, to what we can do with our hands. And if anything, today that there's more technology, there's more of a focus on traditionalism than there was 10 years ago when technology was still young. So I don't, I'm not afraid that technology is going to make us less sensitive, less connected. I can talk to my grandmother every single day because of technology versus 20 years ago you had to wait for a letter to move on. And that makes me feel more connected as an international person who lives on a different continent than my grandmother. And I think that's really key when, when I'm a grandmother I'll have video with my grandkids, and all of a sudden they'll be able to be around the world. Chances are there'll be VR where I could even, in theory, touch them. That's actually big. That's already <laughs> it's, it's big. I'm like, it's in, in the 20 process. years, I'm like, not in two years. You brought up very interesting things of how, like, what's happening now in this country um, is forcing people to ask themselves questions that they haven't you know, they haven't been asked, but that have been happening around the world. Like I'm from a country, I'm from Dominican Republic, where we've lived through dictatorships. And I see some things on TV that, you know, it's, we've seen it. history. I mean, we've seen it. It's just hard for people that have never seen it to ask themselves these questions and question, you know, where they're coming from. But what I'm trying to say is as storytellers, as people, I mean, everybody in this room can be a storyteller. Like if you have an Instagram, if you have Facebook, if you have a pen and a pencil, you can be a storyteller. And where I feel like we're moving towards a society where that role is becoming so big and so easy to uh, communicate. So I guess like my question would be in this very tense and very, and very significant moment in which like women are having more of a voice, um, where people are realizing like the issues that we're having, what are questions, um, what are 
thoughts that you have that you would like other storytellers, like people that have not not necessarily influence, but that have access to technology. What should we ask ourselves when making content, when making technology? Like, what are things that what what's like one question that you ask yourself when you're trying to create a piece of work or a piece of law, whatever it is? What what makes you sensible to that social change? Like, what are things that you ask yourself? Like Gaia said something very interesting that she said as a designer I need to not design for the majority and the privilege I need to design for other people and that's incredibly interesting what are things that you ask yourself before you communicate before you make a strategy that make you more sensible to that social change that we need so badly I hope that makes sense one of the um, things that I take into consideration when I'm often building out strategies like working with the New York Times or building out new technology is what's my target audience? And my my thing is I wanted to appeal to appeal to everyone. I'm all about diversity and inclusion, especially being a woman of color and technology. You know, I want to make sure my voice is heard or my work is seen. So that's one thing that I always think about when I'm creating my next strategy or working on my next project. Who am I talking to and how am I going to make sure that my voice is seen that this is going to appeal to all audience? This is going to appeal to someone who's maybe not in technology but has an interest as well because um, technology is something that everyone's interested in right now. We have so many different cool emerging things happening. So that's one of the major things that I uh, make sure that I have value in to make sure that everyone can appeal to this not just the target audience, but to make sure that it's relatable to everyone or relatable to the topic so that the masses can understand exactly the point or the message just trying to be perceived. I guess I always wonder who, who um, be, I'm, I'm very collaborative as it is, um, having switched careers and kind of being at the bottom of one and learning my way. Um, I think there's people way more capable than me to solving something and um, unless I'm the perfect or at least a potential solution to a problem um, my question is who like, who do you there is no leader without a follower so like who can I follow in the in the path of solution and reach out to that person because I might be useless in it but my power might be in shining a light on it okay. so I think who are who are the key People. There was a game at one point where you had to look at your life and think about how you got where you were and trace it back to the one key person who kind of opened that door for you. And most of our lives will go down to like two or three people. So maybe the same with the problem is who, who are those key people that could lead the revolution? I think it's a, it's a really, it's a tough question. Yeah. It's a, I think it's something that we all grapple with. Um, one thing I would say is, like the question for me that often comes up is, how do I not be mediocre about it? it and it, it's really hard because there are a lot of people trying to solve a problem, but we are at a very unique time in my opinion, which is that uh, nobody cares that you're from the Dominican Republic and are gonna put you down. Or like, I mean, I can be on this panel and like nobody cares that I'm from India. The, the equalization has already happened at least here, and you are on the same footing as everyone else. So the only thing that's going to trip you up is you being afraid of like delivering something and delivering something really good. If it's good, you'll be accepted. And that, that's basically it at this point. So I think like being true to what you're trying to get to, it, it's really important. I think one thing just to add to that, um, bringing it back to what I said initially, I think we live in a very complex society where we make everything very complex. My one question is, what's the truth? If I'm telling a story, what is, what is, what is the truth about the things that I'm talking about? Um, I think we've gotten into a, a society where we're always judging stuff up or finding ways to say things or to communicate things in you know, these very um, fluid ways, but tell, tell the truth. I think people connect with that, um, and they know they if they can connect with that, they can figure out what their next step is or their next action, actionable item. So if you're a storyteller, tell the truth about whatever you're, you're talking about. 